Discovery Park. It is so many things to so many different people. I'd like to think of it as Seattle's greatest restoration project. It has changed hands many times. One of the beauties of Discovery Park is that it's a place that is defined by its master plan, where the citizens of Seattle have collectively said, we want to make this place for nature. For over 4,000 years, the first people of the Salish Sea have utilized the generous bounty of the waters and land, now known as Discovery Park. A unique area that had both saltwater foods and upland foods that were available to the first peoples of this area. Pekahat Altu is the word we used to identify that village that was kind of tucked away there in what's now called the West Point Treatment Facility. It was literally a paradise. In the mid-1800s, European settlers came to Magnolia as subsistence farmers. As Seattle grew, its economy emerging, developers and bankers began to divide up land for public and private use with increasing economic motives. In 1886, King County commissioners relayed a wish to have a permanent garrison in Seattle, offering land free to the Army. The Seattle Chamber of Commerce was energized into action, knowing a fort would bring revenues to an economically struggling city. The Chamber lobbied the Army in earnest, putting together a complicated acquisition plan to buy and trade land, then given free to the Army, on behalf of the city. Fort Lawton was placed on Magnolia Bluff with only a faint nod to strategic placement. By 1964, it was clear that Fort Lawton did not fit the modern military defensive needs of a nation. A citizens committee planning the major forward thrust bond in 1965 included $3 million as seed money for a park at Fort Lawton. In early 1968, Seattle voters approved this bond issue. 25 civic and environmental groups, led by U.S. District Judge Donald S. Voorhees, organized the Citizens for Fort Lawton Park. The first stage of acquiring the post was when Don Voorhees and Bob Kildall and myself sort of sat around and said, how are we going to make this happen? Well, the key actor in this, of course, was Don Voorhees and his relationship with Senator Jackson. Don Voorhees knew how to play that political game and was very methodical in making all the right moves and contacting the right people and lobbying for creation of the park. In 1968, the Department of Defense announced plans to level 330 Fort Acres to build an anti-ballistic missile base. The citizens for Fort Lawton Park protested, seeking action from Washington's U.S. Senator Henry M. Jackson one of the senators who proposed the missile site be at Fort Lawton. It seems to me that this area in the heart of the city is one of our last open areas available for park purposes. It has all of the requirements that I see is necessary if we're going to plan ahead and provide for the kind of environment that we should have in this great metropolitan area. He posed this concept of post to parks which had implications all over the United States. So this is all as a result of this effort to bring Fort Lawton onto 
Seattle as a park in a way that Seattle could afford it. Fort Lawton would not have happened if it hadn't been for that bill because it included the no compensation transfer of surplus federal lands. The next set of discussions was how many of those buildings that the Army was walking away from would stay and how many would be torn down and which ones. And this led to an extended discussion with the folks at Historic Seattle and other historic preservationists. And of course, there were people like me who were pushing for all the buildings to come down because we wanted to have it as much a wilderness park as possible. In the end, the city council passed legislation saving seven historic military buildings to stand as empty, silent memorials to the old army base. It was an age of cooperation. And I think it's something that we don't appreciate now, but when you think back in the 70s, there's very much a spirit of let's come together, let's make this happen, we can all do this together. It was so large, they said, you can't have a park this large. How could the city possibly afford to maintain it? We can build houses here. The number of different groups that wanted a piece of Discovery Park or Fort Lawton, as it was then known. Every one of them was a fight and a debate and ongoing issues, and Fort Lawton was no different. We had the historians, we had the army who wanted to kind of preserve that memory. Then we ended up with the United Indians. In 1970, Northwest Native Americans peacefully occupied and protested outside Fort Lawton for over three weeks. Led by Colville native Bernie White Bear and Puyallup Bob Satyakum to reclaim land for local urban Indians. U.S. Indian treaties promised reversion of surplus military lands back to their original owners. This protest garnered much media coverage and public pressure forced government leaders to meet the United Indians of All Tribes Council at the bargaining table. After five months of negotiations, a renewable lease for 20 acres to the United Indians for 99 years was granted. Once it was clear that the fort was going to come to us as a park, we needed to develop a vision for the park. And that was where we were involving Dan Kiley in his development of the master plan. And there were quite a number of citizen groups from the League of Women Voters to the Audubon Society to Sierra Club, all these different organizations to sit on a committee to work with Dan Kiley and tell him what we thought. Getting Dan Kiley in here to do that was in itself, I think, a real victory alone to find him and get him to willing to come to Seattle and look this over and write that plan. When he saw it and said, this should be a wilderness park, we felt that we'd really made a, a great step forward. The original proposal by Kiley for what to do with Fort Lawton was really key to convincing everyone that this was a good idea and this is what we should do. And the idea of having it primarily a place that is not developed. We didn't want Ferris wheels and amusement parks and things like that in it. And he understood that. He really understood that very well. And he was quite good at giving us the grounds to argue for that. But the idea of a wilderness park was really inherent in what all of us wanted to accomplish. And that was really in the Kylie Master Plan. And so as the plan was translated into something that the Parks Department could adopt, 
in their own wisdom, their own way of viewing the world and their language. We, of course, had to struggle with them, I guess, I think that's the right word, to struggle with them to get as much of the Kylie master plan and that vision of a wilderness park in place. The master plan philosophy was, we've got lots of active parks, what we need is a passive park. One that allows people to reconnect with nature, the environment, to recharge their batteries, so to speak, and be enjoyed by a broad range of people rather than special interests that have a particular activity that they want to pursue. And that held up. It was criticized as being interesting, a kind of an elitist Eastern attitude because Kylie was of course, East Coast, but that was overcome and because there was lots of support for not doing major development there. As we celebrate these 50 years of amazing success, we have to temper it with looking forward. What's gonna happen in 50 years? Where is this park gonna be? What's it going to look like? The pressures, the numbers of people that are visiting the park, like all our green spaces, there are going to be stressors and stresses on this park that we need to think about and we need to plan for. And most importantly, we need citizens to stand up and say, we need to take care of this place. And I'm confident that the citizens of this city are going to do their best to take care and to steward this park into the future. There are locations within Discovery Park where you get to experience that peace and quiet, that tranquility of 4,000 years ago.